All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar. We have Run Safe, Smart and Successful. This is brought to you by Sports Health at NYU Langone. So before we begin, please take a second, mute your computer's microphone and telephone. If you'd like to submit a question, um, excuse me, to any of our speakers today, please type that over here on the right-hand side. You'll see your Q&A box at the bottom right-hand bottom right -hand corner of your screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible later at the end of our presentation. Today's webinar will also be recorded and published on NYU Langone's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash NYU LMC. So I'm Jess Mobalt, your moderator and host today. I'm a licensed strength coach and runner and run coach here in New York City, and I'm runner's world coach going on my second year of that. Uh, I'm an avid runner myself. My favorite distance right now, I think, is the half marathon, but I've done uh, 15 marathons for now. So I was training for Chicago. I'll postpone that till 2021. So anyway, moving on, thanks again for joining us. I am very pleased to introduce you to our panel of NYU Langone experts. To start, we have Dr. Dennis Cardone. He's a pediatric and adult sports medicine specialist and an associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery with a special interest in treating runners, young athletes, and athletes with special needs. He's also a team physician for various universities and organizations, including New York University, Long Island University, USA Wrestling, USA Fencing, and New York City Public Schools Athletic League, among others. We also have Samantha Heller. She's a senior clinic nutritionist, registered dietitian, and exercise um, psychologist, where she helps athletes optimize their health and performance. She is the author of a best-selling book, has appeared on numerous news and TV shows, and hosts the popular health and fitness show for Sirius XM Doctor Radio. So next, we have Dr. Bonnie Marks. She practices rehabilitation psychology at Rusk Rehab. Dr. Bonnie Mark offers 19 years of clinical experience in helping individuals become more successful in achieving their life goals. She is working at Rusk in several positions, including brain injury, concussion, and sports performance as a psychologist. Welcome, Bonnie. We have Bethany Rittenauer. She's a senior psych. A, excuse me, physical therapist at NYU Langone's Orthopedic Center, where she treats orthopedic injuries in athletes and active individuals. Not only is she a certified strength and conditioning specialist, she's also a certified Ironman coach. Bethany is an avid cyclist and triathlete, participating in multiple sprint, Olympic, and half Ironman distances, triathlons, the New York City Marathon, and international cycling events. Very cool. So next, we have Heather Milton. She's a clinical exercise psychologist, supervisor, and strength conditioning specialist at NYU Langone Sports Performance Center. She develops specialized programs and leads many classes to help athletes reach their maximum potential and ability, including the running lab, a comprehensive program to help individuals improve their running performance while preventing injury. She has a well-rounded group of experts, and oh, we have a well-rounded group of experts here, and specialists across many sports health disciplines. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jess. That was great, and we're so lucky to have you as part of our group today. I think that all of us on this panel, psychologists, physiologists, dietitians, and exercise scientists, as well as physicians and physical therapists all have different um, runners coming from different angles. Just an introductory slide to really just show that there's a lot of moving pieces to the puzzle in order to keep a, a runner healthy. And I, I think it's great that we're all here because a lot of what we do can overlap in some ways. And we have a lot of different experiences that we can pull together. and potentially give a lot of great information to all the runners in the audience out there today. I couldn't agree more. So we're going to jump right over to Dr. Cardone um, and talk about any injuries he's seeing now. Let's see here. So yeah, what kind of injuries are you seeing in the office now, Dr. Cardone? 
You know, I think there's there's really two things that, to talk about when it comes to injuries that we're seeing in this environment. One is disuse, right? So for many of our runners, they potentially took maybe even a few months off from running and are returning back to running. So now they have this muscle weakness and muscle imbalance. And the other part are the runners that are getting out there and they're just doing too much too soon, going from that proverbial zero to 60. So some of the more common injuries are same of this same common ones that we've seen even pre-COVID. And I'd say most common is what we call our anterior knee pain, runner's knee pain, or patellofemoral syndrome. And this truly is about a muscle imbalance related, again, to disuse. Um, so part of it is not running, coming back and starting a running program, and then having this uh, disuse problem, muscle imbalance that leads to this anterior knee pain. There's no doubt that in runners, you know, we're seeing the same shin splints, we're seeing our share of stress fractures as well, and Achilles problems. These are just common running injuries that we're going to see at, really at all times with runners. I'd say, interestingly, the one that I'm seeing less of, and it's because of being in a New York City environment, is plantar fasciitis. And I would relate that to because less people are doing walking in the city. So now, without that much walking on pavement, I think I'm seeing in combination with running, uh, less of the plantar fasciitis. Wow, that's that's interesting to know. And so to jump ahead of you know injuries and maybe talk about even prevention, we're going to throw it over to Bethany and talk about running form um, and how we could maybe focus on that a little bit. Sure. So what's the ideal running form that we're really looking for? I'm sure everybody sees a whole host of different running forms when they're out on their runs. Maybe they look wonderful like Jess probably does when she goes, or maybe they look like a mess like I probably do. But regardless, we don't really want to ask that question. What we really want to ask is how can you complete your runs and prevent injury? There are certain key asymmetries that we really want to look for, and we want to prevent the repetitiveness of those asymmetries happening, and especially when you start to get pretty fatigued. Two common asymmetries that occur with endurance athletes, both at baseline and with fatigue, are with the pelvic drop. And then the next slide, I'll talk about a different one. The first is a pelvic drop, and this usually leads to knee collapse. And this is speaking on the anterior knee pain that Dr. Cardone mentioned. Usually, as we notice in the middle and right picture, we get hip weakness, and that hip weakness in the gluteal muscles, which perform two roles, moving your leg in space, but also stabilizing the trunk. The weakness and fatigue in these muscle groups can fail the trunk, the pelvis, the leg, or all of the above as seen in the middle picture. Issues with this type of weakness could be knee pain, hip pain, IT band syndrome, just to name a couple of them. And the picture on the right is an assessment from the running lab here at NYU. And you can see the red arrow on his right leg displaying force into the medial knee and his shin area um, or on the his left leg, but on the right side of the picture. And this is really starting to speak on different kinds of gluteal weaknesses that we can address with easy exercises that we'll mention in later slides. A second asymmetry involves the cross balance between the abs, the glutes, the lower back, and hip flexors. A weak core in combination with tight hip flexors and weak glute max muscles will lead to increased strain on the lower back. Ideally, the glute max should be anchored by a strong core, allowing powerful activation and push off during the running cycle. And if these groups are weak, the body will rely on increased movement in the lumbar region to generate force. So if you see the pictures on the right with the red marks, you can see that the lumbar region has an increased arch to accommodate the push off from the lower leg. So really what could possibly contribute to your risk of these injuries and how can you determine if they're influencing you? Have you been working from home for the past six months? Perhaps your core is weak and your hip flexors are tight from sitting all day. Women also have to be more aware of hip and knee positioning because of their wider hips. They could be predisposed to the valgus positioning I mentioned earlier. 
Um, a great way to self-assess is to look at your old race photos if you run before. Um, this one that I have on the slide is has a hip drop that I noted earlier. And finally, if you have a mirror to look at your form, you, know, you can try a single leg squat. In this photo, the individual all the way on the left in A has the best form. B has a little bit of that trunk deviation, which could be from weak gluteal muscles um, or just core muscles in themselves. C is a, a, the same, but a little bit of a different deviation. And D has that contributing factor of the knee valgus. So here are top five exercises that you can use to prevent running injuries. Um, you wanna be able to build a stable lumbopelvic complex. So lower back, core, and hips. You can hit the side plank to assist with stabilization of the whole core, the glute max and the gluteus medius complex in optimal alignment. Um, the glute medius has to stabilize both at the pelvis and the femur. So at weakness at both of these sites can lead to hip drop and valgus. Um, the normal plank with hip extension can hit many birds with one stone. You have core strengthening, quadriceps strengthening, and you're training your hip extensors or hip extension to be performed on a strong, solid core foundation. The key is to limit lumbar extension and collapse, which we saw in that one photo all the way on the right on that main slide while performing the extension of the hip. Um, Sideline hip abduction, which is the photo on the top right, is a basic glute media strengthening exercise. Um, I usually recommend to perform this exercise way up against the wall, your back, your butt, and your heel up against the wall to get the max alignment possible so you don't cheat with other muscle groups. Um, and the bottom or in the middle right next to it is a single leg squat. And that's where you're looking at that slide that we looked at previously, where you're assessing if you have any of these deviations and maybe correcting and making sure you have proper alignment that I mentioned before. And then finally, side stepping, side, uh, excuse me, side stepping with the band is a great exercise for dynamic stabilization of the hip and the knee. If your band is placed at the ankle, you just want to make sure that when you sidestep, you don't inadvertently go into the valgus position. You almost want to lead the sidestep with your knee out, almost like one of the old Mario video game characters. And you're going to look very awkward like the little mushroom guy. So you always want to lead with your knee instead of your foot so that your knee doesn't collapse in. These are all great exercises, Bethany. I actually... program for a runner that includes strength training. So strength training, despite the fact that so many runners tend to feel like they have to just run and run more and run even more to get better at running, we know through the literature that strength training is one of the best ways not only to help prevent those injuries, because you can have a lot of those exercises that Bethany uh, mentioned, but you can also improve your performance running. So um, this slide is just giving a summary of all of the research that we have. This is the best type of program that you can integrate into your running. Of course, it depends how many times per week you're able to do it, depending on the volume of the running that you're doing. But especially now where we have a, a period of time where there are no in-person races, especially in New York City, um, where you can really start to think about your overall program and integrating some of these strength training routines, these exercises to help maintain your health and keep you a better runner, especially when you want to go back to running at a higher volume. Um, like Dr. Cardone said, if you go from zero to 100, that's when we start to see all those injuries prop back up. So a maintenance strength program is great. You just wanna make sure that you can build enough intensity. So it doesn't mean intensity like heart rate intensity, it means intensity like how challenging the exercise is. Wanna make sure that you're lifting or doing the exercises heavy enough to actually adapt and become stronger. Um, so if you're wondering how to do that at home without any equipment, or if you have minimal equipment at home now, um, without and you're wary of going to the gym, I assure you, you can do it with body weight, with resistance bands, finding weights at home, like if you have a backpack you can fill up or a sandbag, a rice bag, um, or just purchases. Now you can purchase weights a little bit more easily than you could do back in spring. Um, to give yourself some exercises. Now, this doesn't have to be anything complicated. It can be as simple as doing a couple of lower body strength exercises and a few upper body exercises. 
I always include upper body to maintain a well-rounded program and keep muscular balance like Dr. Cardone alluded to and making sure that you're doing some postural strength as well. When we're running, you would want to have a slight lean forward. So you want your endurance muscles of your trunk, of your back, of your core to be very strong and be able to maintain that over a long period of time. The long I was just thinking a dynamic warm up is also. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a gap. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so for the warm up, a warm up is also very important for injury prevention and performance. It doesn't have to be super long. And this is another thing I catch a lot of my runners doing is jumping in and just going straight to the run, especially now. You know, um, if you're working at home, you have a little bit of extra time because you're not commuting to work. Now is a good time to take advantage of that and take your time through a full warm up. It's going to activate all the muscles we want to be active to prevent that pelvic drop and those injuries that we've talked about already. It can also make you run for the case of running. We actually see lower heart rates and lower perceived exertion if you do a dynamic warm up before you start the run. Now to the actual. This is going to vary depending on the type of race that you're training for. If you are training for a half marathon or a marathon, or if you're just getting out there and starting to do more running more consistently now as a primary form of exercise, since we're all kind of trying to avoid uh, people, a lot of people in gym. So if you're just starting out with running, your long run might be just, you know, a No more Remember, slow and steady adaptation is the best rather than trying to, to adapt and do a lot all at once. Now, if you're an experienced runner and you have multiple runs during the week, you would only have one really longer run and then try to do mid distance runs during the week. And if you've already done some races or you've gotten up to your, your goal distance, which would let's say it's a half marathon or a marathon and you ha have experience completing that distance, then you can start to add more um, intervals, threshold runs. These are more quality workouts that are going to focus on the pace. You can focus on like running cues and drills for form during these as well. Um, and these are really going to help you to improve your, your time during races over the long run. No pun intended. But threshold and interval runs are much higher intensity. So you only want to do these a couple of days per week, even for very experienced runners. We don't recommend doing them frequently and you can actually periodize this and put it through cycles. So you're only doing about four weeks or eight weeks at a time. If you're training for a race, you would want to do it close to when the race right before your taper. So you're really getting all those adaptations. So you're peaking at the right time for your race, but then you can always kind of right now, focus on these and get some quality runs in, even if you don't have time for longer runs. And that would be good practice for when you need them during your um, training when marathons and races start again. But I actually wanted to throw it over to Bonnie now and ask you a couple of questions on what your thoughts are on the on those higher intensity runs. Hi, well, I my feeling about that is that um, you know, some people talk about long runs and, and they other people recommend um, shorter runs. So the question is what to do. So there, I mean, you, the whole thing boils down to um, what's your purpose in running? Like, why do you run? So running can be um, a stress reliever or it can move over into the stress territory where the cortisol levels rise and we don't want that to happen. So, and we know that injuries result when stress uh, increases. So we know that it's healthier to keep your stress down. So then we have to listen to our body and also what are the things that we say to ourselves? You know, what's the negative self-talk we may be adding? So we wanna be aware of the levels of stress. We want to remind ourselves why we run or even repurpose our running and, and how it feeds us. And I think one of the best solutions is routine. I think we all thrive on routine. And so, you know, just, you know, having a routine time of day, how far and what route, um, you can be creative with a route that will keep you motivated. And uh, the, basically listening to your body 
and stress levels should be your guide. Um, and if you find that you really are very stressed and um, struggling, reach out to someone you trust, um, whether it's a psychologist, a friend, uh, you know, your dog. <laughs> but, uh, you know, reach out to, uh, to someone and uh, really take care of yourself. The main thing here is self-care. Yeah, I think those are all great points. I think a lot of times, like I mentioned, And that should really be those like more calm, slow and steady runs that are meant for adaptations for your aerobic system. Um, so higher intensity runs really do need more recovery time too. So back to that self care, listening to your body, giving yourself time, like you put in the effort for high intensity work, or even if you're just getting into strength training or starting to lengthen your runs that your body might need some time to recover from that. And you're actually going to be better off because you're giving yourself that time for your cortisol levels to be lower again, for your immune system to adapt and become healthier. Um, and eventually it leads to even better running. So um, I'm curious, Sam, what are your thoughts on recovery when it comes to um, nutrition and hydration? Well, what's interesting is a lot of athletes are just so happy that they got their run done, that they skipped the whole recovery process that you're just mentioning. And so why do we care about recovery? Well, we want to replete the glycogen, our glycogen stores. We want to rehydrate. We want to get that protein resynthesis happening. And, and research is looking, and although the timeline is a little bit of fluid, we used to say, oh, within 15 minutes of completing a hard workout or run or an hour or two hours. So that timeline is changing a little bit. But as soon as you can, after you run, and it's a long run, and it's or it's an intense run, or it's multiple runs or workouts in a day. If you're just running, you know, three or four or five miles, you probably can just make sure you're hydrated and not worry so much about what you're eating. But for, you know, the longer runs that, you know, Heather, you and Bethany and, and uh, Bonnie are discussing, and, and even Dr. Cardone, Dennis, um, we need to make sure we're recovering so our bodies are refueling and rehydrating. So what does that really mean? Well, if you're not refueling or rehydrating properly, you're going to be really exhausted. But if you do, then your energy is going to be where you need it to be post recovery and for the next run, for the next day, for the next workout. So that means consuming some carbohydrate and some protein, you know, as close to when you finish as you can. If you're doing a long run, you may not feel like eating right away. You certainly have to make sure you're rehydrating. We'll talk a little bit about sweat rate in a minute. But 15, 20 grams of protein, maybe about a gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight or half a pound, you know, 0.5 grams per pound, sorry, not half a pound, about 50 grams. So what is that? I, you know, plain or regular milk, a soy, this is where the chocolate milk comes in. Everyone was so excited about, remember when everyone's like, I can chocolate milk, yay. Um, you could do a fruit smoothie with some soy milk. I like the idea of that protein. The whey in dairy actually helps resynthesize protein a little faster than the soy protein. Uh, lentil soup and crackers, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a cup with a glass of milk, cereal and a banana. You know, who doesn't love their cereal? You can mix that in a smoothie. So it sort of depends on what you're in the mood for. You can also just rehydrate um, and then have a meal, or you can do a small, you know, a little bit of protein and carbohydrate and wait an hour or two and then have a meal. Kind of depends how your GI tract is, is working. Um, so we want to make sure that we're on board with that. Uh, I can't see uh, the slides. Heather aren't keeping up with what people are saying, so I don't know what the next, my next slide is. Um, but maybe it's about hydration. So I think what research is finding is most of us, even just walking out the door, or the research they did was when we used to go to the gym, are, hype, are hypohydrated. We're just not drinking enough fluids throughout the day. And it's not just when you're running, when you're exercising, it has to be an all day affair. Our bodies don't have any place to store fluid. We, we lose fluid when we breathe, you know, and you go, 
on a mirror, wipe it off. It's moist. You, you lose fluid, obviously, when you sweat, when you pee. So what we want to do is make sure we're hydrated throughout the day. That's going to keep our bodies functioning at a better level. It will help our immune system function. Everybody's very worried about that nowadays. You know, the Institute of Medicine says men should have about 16 cups a day, women about 12. Athletes probably need more than that. And and water by itself is not a great rehydrator. So if you're sweating a lot, you're probably losing more water, more fluids, more electrolytes. So this is where sports drinks come in. So how do you know if you are? If you're a salty sweater, you have that sort of salty, gritty feeling on your face. It may taste salty. You may see white stains on your clothes. You have to make sure you're consuming enough sodium, which for a lot of Americans, we don't want them to, but for athletes, I'm not as worried about that sodium level. Um, this is where a sports drink comes in. So it's got some carbohydrate to, to help replenish your glycogen stores, which we just talked about, but it also has sodium and potassium to help replenish those electrolytes. So the electrolytes are really important for muscle function, for heart function, for a whole lot of neurological issues. So we may need to make sure that we're well hydrated for that. But how do you know whether you're well hydrated? So, you can go through all kinds of expensive plasma osmolality, burn specific gravity tests, deuterium oxide dilution, or when you pee, you can just take a look at your pee and say, is it, is it like apple juice? Because if it looks a little like apple juice, then you're probably dehydrated. If it looks a little more like lemonade, then you're doing pretty well. So that's an easy way to sense whether you're well hydrated or not. Just look at your pee, understanding that it's going to be diluted by the water in the toilet because we're not all peeing in glasses, right? Um, and then maintaining that fluid intake throughout the day. Wow. Heather? <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, what I appreciate about that was it's easy to understand. I found myself getting more and more thirsty as I was listening to you talk. Uh, we're going to throw it over to Dr. Cardone, and he's going to talk about some safety and staying safe um, and healthy while running. Yes, I think it's certainly important in this COVID environment, you know, to address some of these issues. And these certainly come up a lot, you know, in the in the office setting. And I have runners that constantly will ask me some of these questions. So let, let's kind of go through them. You know, is it safe to run outside? So I think the big thing that we're all very aware of, we should be exercising, absolutely. We should all be promoting exercising and running. And most of our exercises should be outside, right? We should try to avoid indoors still as much as possible and we should be outside. So is it safe to run outside? Yes, um, especially if we're running in small groups or as an individual and maybe not even in a group. And especially for runners, you know, that really is what we can would consider a very safe form of activity and exercise to do. Um, only if you're in an urban center, you know, if you're in New York City, even now, streets may not be that crowded, but if you are in an area where you know you'll be coming into crowds, that would be the time to think about putting a mask on. So I wouldn't, we don't recommend wearing a mask during or while running the whole time, but if you're going into a crowded area, then to put your mask on. You know, they've done some studies looking at what type of mask is best uh, when you are exercising. And it's really probably any type of mask that just covers the mouth and nose is not that much important to what the mask is made of. It's more just that you're using it properly and covering, again, the mouth and the nose when you're when you are exercising and running. Should you avoid running in a group? And the answer to that is probably yes. You know, as much as we can, we shouldn't be in groups. And that's why we don't really recommend a lot of group activities. Uh, so running is a great sport that you could do solo or maybe just with a running partner. Uh, and there's really no reason to be in a group. If you are in a group, then you should just practice, again, distancing. And even that's controversial. There have been some studies looking at distancing uh, in runners compared to walking. And probably the key here is don't run directly behind someone, right? You're in their airflow. So better that you're, if you're running with a partner or in a group, that you're more in a side-by-side -side pattern as opposed to one right behind the other. Can coronavirus be sped, uh, spread through the sweat? It's really through, um, um, obviously, as we know, through secretions that come through the nose and the mouth. So sweat is not a concern right now for spreading the coronavirus. Is my immune system work weaker post-marathon or after a hard workout? And again, there have been a lot of studies that have looked at this over many, many years. 
The thought is that once you introduce strenuous activity and strenuous run, and especially something like post-marathon, that there may be a short interval, and we're talking about hours, uh, where your immune system may be a bit weakened. I mean, ultimately, running is great for the immune system in the long term, but in the short term, after a heavy-duty workout or a marathon, it may be a period where that immune system is a little bit weaker, and you may be more prone to certain types of, uh, we'll say, viruses in general, uh, but certainly exposure to a COVID virus at a time when the immune system is weak would be concerning. So post-marathon, there is some concern for hours afterward. And again, here, our gym is safe for indoor training. So with proper distancing and wearing of a mask, yes, it probably is safe, but as much as possible, especially when weather is still nice outside, we should be keeping our exercise outdoors and really avoiding indoor exercise as much as possible. That's helpful information. Easy to follow and understand and apply. So thank you for that. So Bonnie, we're gonna talk about how to stay motivated in our current climate. I speak for, um, on my behalf during, you know, the last few months of staying at home and quarantine and races being canceled. I found my motivation high at times just to get out, you know, for mental health and also very low at times, you know, everyone getting the news of canceled races. And um, I'd love to hear your expertise on staying motivated and reasons to still get out the door or how to listen to your body and mind um, together. Yeah, it's not easy, <laughs> right? And we have so much screen time now too. So uh, you know they have they have done some studies, by the way, on depression and screen time, and they find that people who spend more than eight hours a day on screen time be, are more depressed. They're more prone to depression than those who work less hours. You know, eight hours. Um, and the, so the recommendation there is just to replace some of that sedentary time, hopefully with some yoga or, or uh, lacing up for some miles. But uh, staying motivated, there's a lot, a number of running clubs around the country now um, who are using social media and because it really enhances connection. So one of the um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities for depression is being isolated or not. To, uh, you know, not staying connected socially uh, through social media. So, uh, you know, we want to avoid that. So the running clubs are great. Um, they're having online events. And of course, you've probably read about the New York Roadrunners Club. They even have a, a kid's website now. And they have some wonderful training programs. And of course, Facebook is always good. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of virtual runs now too. So, you know, uh, Participating in virtual runs are great, and also tracking your progress, logging your time, tracking apps like Strava or, you know, some in some of the virtual races, uh, they have an honor system. But certainly, um, you know, running clubs are great, and you know, just staying in touch with people, namely, because that that's just so important is not to be isolated, and also, you know, just be creative with your route. You know, you might. Try, try a different one for a week or two, something totally different. So just a little bit of routine, but yet uh, stay with it. I love that. And honestly, something that helped me get back in my groove was truthfully the runner's world run streak, um, because it was just, you know, 10 minutes a day or about one mile committing to just one mile. And like you said, starting earlier, we all thrive on routine. And I noticed um, such an improvement in my overall you know, mental headspace and my physical ability and just sticking to my a day where I feel really good about with the routine of just getting out the door at a certain time, even if it's just for one mile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, because small things do matter. Small changes that you make along the way, they're accumulative and they do matter. So these these changes may not sound like major changes, but they're important. So changes and and, lo and also logging your time, I think, is important, too, because that's a motivator. If you log your time, um, you know, whether you use a technology or just keep your own uh, record system, uh, it's important to log your progress and celebrate small steps of progress. So no um, small step is too small to celebrate. 
Um, I run far and quarantine backyard ultra is, is great for, you know, what created a response to the pandemic, of course, and, um, people run on their own time. And it's really kind of fun to see <laughs> where people are logging their miles these days, you know, up and down their stairwell or fire escape or, you know, and their driveways, rooftops in the city. Um, and, you know, some runners have turned exclusively to virtual. So it's, it's really become quite a motivator uh, and very exciting. So, you know, the, in some cases it creates competition and a sense of community. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, you know, if you feel like it's, uh, you're stressed out by it, then just, you know, give yourself a break. If you, you know, take, take an off day, you know, take, if you have an off day, take it off. Uh, because, you know, just give yourself a chance for recovery. And as uh, Bethany had mentioned earlier, fatigue does uh, exacerbate injuries. So um, you don't, you just want to give yourself a break and there's always another day. But, um, you know, I was thinking that Samantha, I was thinking that stress is actually desserts, right? I mean, desserts is stress spelled backwards. So I was- It is. <laughs> But it's okay to have a dessert once in a while too. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'll go with that. You know, and also the idea of leaving the watch at home from time to time, if it's a beautiful day, but if you know yourself and you can get a little too caught up in competition sometimes, um, you know, it, it's a good chance to get outside, get some sunshine, feel the fresh air in your face. If you're dealing with a lot of screen time or, you know, meetings or, you know, things at home, it's a really nice time to step away mentally without that physical pressure of competition just by leaving the watch at home and knowing you'll return, you know, 15, 20 minutes later. Yeah, so we're going to talk doc, uh, back to Dr. Cardone. I'd love to hear about returning um, post returning to running post COVID. You know, unfortunately, with the COVID virus, there's still a lot that we don't understand about it. And, and also unfortunate that it really does seem to affect a significant amount of, of our systems of our body systems. So one thing that we've learned is and really with any virus, especially with the COVID virus, if you've had an infection, even if at this point, if you're asymptomatic, if you have a very mild, mild infection, it is still a good idea to wait at least 10 to 14 days before doing any form of strenuous type exercise. And the reason for that is because of the effect that it can have on, again, some of our body systems. And the most important one where we're seeing a significant amount of potential complications is the heart or the cardiac system. There's something called myocarditis and certain viruses have a predilection for the heart meaning that they will affect the heart. So if you looked at uh, even college football, other uh, collegiate athletes and other athletes, and look at some of the studies that have come out, there's really been a significant amount of these cardiac complications. Uh, they looked at a college study and it was as many as 15% of athletes in college post COVID had this myocarditis problem, which can be very concerning. So I will tell you, for example, with our collegiate athletes who have test positive for COVID, we test every single one of our collegiate athletes with an EKG and an echocardiogram. So I don't mean to put the scare into runners in any way, but again, if you have the COVID virus, wait at least 10 to 14 days before exercising. A good general rule is to see your physician or healthcare provider before returning to any strenuous activity. Um, and potentially have an EKG or an echocardiogram, especially if you have any risk factors. You know, do you have high blood pressure? Have you had any heart problems in the past? Do you have any chronic disease in general? Because there's always the potential for exacerbation and worsening uh, post COVID. So, you know, unfortunately, it's a virus that we need to take very serious, and especially when we're returning back to sport, back to running after COVID virus, a good idea to have a good complete evaluation by a healthcare provider. That's smart. I like to always say running will be there for you. Have a little bit of patience and return when you're fully healthy um, because that will ultimately be a healthier return. All right, so we're going to throw it back over to Sam and I'm going to have a little bit of tips 
in terms of staying healthy um, with a balanced diet? Well, yes. So it, it's funny, just before we started the, this uh, webinar, Dennis was looking at this, this picture on the slide and he said, what, what is up with that? And the reason I, I, I put this picture on the slide is, A, I thought it looked really cool. Um, I thought it was just an interesting artistic interpretation of something, but my interpretation is when we don't consume enough carbohydrate, this is how we're going to feel when, we, when we're trying to run or even just get through the day. And I know there's a lot of fad diets, There's a lot, and it's been for years really demonizing carbohydrates, but they are our primary source of fuel for our brains. Our brains use twice as much glucose, which is carbohydrate in our blood, blood sugar, as any other organ in the body. Our muscles that we have to have for exercise, almost every cell in the body uses glucose for fuel. So when you are restricting that significantly, you're, you're restricting your body's ability to function. So let's not do that. And then the question is, what are carbohydrates? And when I ask my patients that or my students and they're like, oh, you know, pasta, bread, cookies, and that's true. But there's many foods that contain carbohydrates. So that includes the starchy foods that I've just mentioned, but also all fruits have carbohydrate. All sweets, as you know, contain carbohydrates. Beans, chickpeas, kidney beans, hummus, um, uh, black beans, you know, that refried bean that you like so much. Those are carbohydrates. All the vegetables have carbohydrates. And of course, our sports feels like our gels and our gummies and our beans and our sports drinks. This is what we need for fuel. Now, some of those foods pack a bigger punch in terms of energy than others, meaning energy, what I'm talking about is when carbohydrates get digested in your stomach and absorbed into your small intestine, by then they're, they've turned into sugar and that sugar in your bloodstream is called glucose and that is the energy your body uses. I think a lot of our runners know this. And when we store that energy in our muscles and our liver, it's called glycogen. That's the storage form of sugar. And our bodies use that throughout the day. In fact, when our blood sugars start to get a little bit lower throughout the day as our brain and our bodies are using them, that tells us that we're hungry. That signals, that triggers those hunger signals, our stomach growling, we're feeling a little peckish, it's time to eat. That's your body's way of saying you need fuel. But for athletes, a lot of athletes are skimping and, and runners who are, are concerned about being too big to run, they want more speed, they're skimping on carbohydrates and we don't wanna do that. We wanna make sure we have plenty, carbohydrate, plenty of carbohydrates in our diet. So what does that mean? So um, in terms of carbohydrate, I'll get to fats in just one second. Have a black bean and spinach burrito, have a pasta primavera, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich that I mentioned for recovery before. You know, you don't have to eat a ton of carbohydrates, but we want them with every meal as we go along. And certainly the non-starchy vegetables, half your plate makes us happy. Quick 101 on nutrition. All vegetables are good. All fruits are good. All beans are good. All grains are good. All nuts are good. All seeds are good. There's no one magical food that's going to change the world that we know of yet. And we want to have a balance of these foods and healthy fats in our diet because that is what our bodies use synergistically to keep us health, healthy, to keep our immune system strong, and to keep us as athletes functioning at optimal performance level. So in terms of fats, they're complicated and I'm not going to go into great detail, but the healthy fats, we call them unsaturated. And the reason that's confusing for most of us is that nutrition is all chemistry. And I don't know about you, but I skipped out of chemistry in high school because, you know, I was going to be a singer on Broadway and who needs chemistry when you're singing, you know, Oklahoma, right? So it's confusing when we say saturated, Saturated. There's a lot of people out there giving advice on nutrition that are not registered dietitians. So you have to be careful where you're getting your nutrition advice from. We are experts. We've been trained in, I took so many chemistry courses in graduate school, I, my head exploded, but it's fascinating and it's fun and it's how our bodies work. So the unsaturated fat that should just refers to the molecular structure, which is why I just went into that whole chemistry bit. Um, those are the healthy fats. And those are the ones easy to identify liquid at room temperature. 
So what fat is liquid at room temperature? Olive oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil. These are all oils that we like to use for cooking, for eating. Uh, they're also included in nuts and, as I said, avocado in fish, which is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. These are the ones we want to include more often than not in our diets. And again, athletes, again, athletes, and athletes may tend to skip a little bit, so we have to be very careful about that. We need that fat. Also, fat supplies energy when we're exercising. Carbohydrate supplies most, but fat is supplying the energy your body's using right now to watch this webinar with all of these like amazing panelists. The less healthy fats, the one we want to limit. We're not. We're told not to use the word avoid, but you know what? I don't. I kind of don't go by convention. There's some we should avoid. Are saturated again? Molecular structure. What does that mean? solid at room temperature. So what kind of fats are solid at room temperature? Butter, cheese, lard, uh, the fat that used to rise to the top of milk for your great grandmother's you know, milk box, that cream. Um, so primarily animal fats. In, in the plant world, it's coconut and palm oil. Again, they're not healthy oils, they are saturated. And what the research suggests is diets that are high in saturated fats what does that mean? High in meat, processed meat, cheese, your typical Western diet. We have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, maybe even a relationship with um, cognitive decline and dementia. So we have to be thoughtful about what we're eating because just because you run, just because you're exercising doesn't mean you can eat whatever you want. And what's really exciting is our huge, you know, mega sports teams are now hiring sports dietitians to manage their meals and help them eat healthy. And you'll notice that athletes on the field, they're leaner, they're healthier. They're not running out and getting a bucket, bucket of chicken after every game or after every one because they're eating healthier and they're performing better. We also need protein. Thank you, Heather. So protein is important, not just for muscle. Like we think of protein building muscle. Some runners don't want to build muscle. They think it's going to slow them down. But protein is part of our immune system. It's part of the neurotransmitters in our brain. We need protein for many functions in the body. Some runners in particular may not be consuming enough. If it's plant-based, you need to be very thoughtful about that. But, but it's absolutely doable. Strength training, you know, our protein is for muscle protein synthesis. It helps attenuate or slow down muscle protein breakdown. It increases increases our oxidative capacity by increasing mitochondrial protein. What does that mean? Well, the mitochondria in our cells are our little, little power plants. They create power. And the more we exercise, the more little power plants our bodies make to adapt to that change, to adapt to that challenge we're giving it. But they need protein to make these little, these little power packs in our muscles and our body. So protein helps power our workouts for endurance as well as strength. And also for endurance, you know, we're increasing that mitochondrial protein. So how much should we have? There's a big range, you know, and it changes daily. But when you're running or exercising regularly, about 1.2 to 2.2 or 6 or 0.7 grams per kilogram of body weight. It's going to depend on your size, your age, your weight, the level and the intensity and the duration of your exercise. So that's something you want to maybe work with a dietitian, calculate out what you need. But if you don't want to worry about that, just make sure you have some protein with every meal and snack. It helps satiety. It helps you metabolize food better. You know, your carbohydrate, your protein like to work together, as I said, in recovery to help resynthesize that protein and that glycogen synthesis. So we want to make sure we have that balanced plate. About a quarter of your plate should be healthy protein. That includes chicken, fish, if you're plant-based, if you're vegan or vegetarian, it would be tofu, edamame, all legumes, nuts and seeds. There's veggie burgers, there's veggie meatballs. And yes, they're slightly processed. It's true, but that's okay. You don't need to worry about that. If you're including a whole lot of other vegetables in your diet and getting all of that fiber and all of those synergistic nutrients and phytochemicals that balance is going to help fuel your performance. And also, when you're eating that balanced diet, you're also getting the antioxidants and nutrients that help reduce the inflammation and the oxidative stress that's caused by exercise and just right now by life in general. So that will help reduce that inflammation, help us stay healthy, and also help keep our immune system strong. So about 20 to 35 grams per meal. Don't overdose on protein. Oh, I'm going to do all my protein at dinner. That's great. 
Your body can't use more than about 20 to 30 grams a meal. So what does that mean? Chicken breast, three and a half ounces is about 25 grams. Greek yogurt, about eight ounces, about 23 grams. Half a cup of edamame, about 10 or 12 grams. Legumes, similarly, maybe seven or eight. It's pretty easy to get our protein needs met. Plant proteins, you've got hummus and beans and nuts and seeds and seitan, which I didn't mention, and all those really fabulous healthy proteins, again, Balance is what we need to stay healthy. Balance, I love it. You can't outrun a bad diet. Yeah, you can't outrun a bad diet. That's a, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for an excellent and informative presentation. We're ready to answer some questions. So if you have one, and maybe you'll think of one while we're in our Q&A process now, please, again, feel free to drop your questions here on the right-hand side, and we'll get through as many as we can. So we're going to start off with our first one here um, I have. So as a senior athlete, 60 years of age, 60 plus years of age, what kind of fitness test should I take? And more importantly, what kind of stretches should I do to prevent injury? So Bethany, why don't we throw that one over to you as well as Dr. Cardone as well? I'll let you decide who goes first. Uh, I'll go first. Just more in terms of the stretches that you can do to prevent injury. Um, the best things to do, especially as you get older, is to address that tight hip flexor area, or even just tightness in the lower extremities in general. Um, you're gonna get a lot of lumbar tightness and maybe a little bit of stenosis with age. So you wanna make sure that you're decreasing the extra amount of tension and strain that you might get in those areas. And especially because a lot of things come into play, you wanna keep a nice balance between your hip flexors, your glutes, your quads and your hamstrings. You wanna really make sure you're generally stretching everything. But if I had to pick one big one that a lot of my patients that come in that tend to skip, especially now when a lot of people are working from home or being a little bit more sedentary than usual, it would probably be a good hip flexor stretch. You know, in terms of, uh, in terms of fitness tests, it's kind of interesting when I did my training uh, at that time, it was recommended by the ACSM, the American College of Sports Medicine, that just about most people over 40, certainly with any medical conditions, have some sort of exercise stress test. And in the modern day and age, is really very few, um, near, not nearly doing as many stress tests. Um, so certainly anyone who has any, again, chronic disease, especially heart or lung disease, you know, they should have some sort of formal fitness, te fitness test, like a treadmill stress test or a bicycle stress test. But for most others, you know, who are under good, good health care, um, typically don't need any special type of fitness test to begin an exercise program. You know, as we all know, for all of us, as we're aging, you know, more important is to start and at any age group, a gradually progressive running program. I think as we're getting older, recovery is key. You know, so what what helps prevent injury at any age group is maybe not running on successive days, maybe mixing it up with cross training. And that also allows for for body recovery. So I think formal fitness fitness tests are not as important, except for people who have, again, maybe more chronic type problems with heart and lung. Uh, but for others, it's just more a gradual progression. And once they start exercising and doing it and running on a regular basis, you know what? That's some of the best stress tests that you could do if they're tolerating a running program. Awesome. Thank you. Heather, I'm going to throw this one to you. And it says, I'm interested in walking and power walking as an exercise. How much should I walk to keep the cardio up and how often? I'll let you also loop in Dr. Cardo. Okay. Yeah. So for this one, it's, it, there, it depends a lot on what the ultimate goal is, but if the goal is really for your cardiovascular health, the American College of Sports Medicine and CDC recommend getting it at least, so as a minimum, 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity per week. Um, so if you are power walking or walking, you want to make sure first that you're getting into that intensity level, provided you can tolerate it. So um, do the talk test, see if you are able to answer quick questions, yes or no, but you know, you're know you working hard enough so you couldn't carry on a conversation. Um, you could also use that kind of rating of perceived exertion. Is this light activity? Does this feel moderate or somewhat hard? You wanna get at least to the somewhat hard to hard range. And then you know the duration can depend on how 
talks about that, you know, there's a habit to it. A consistent program is the best option for your health. Um, so if you're able to do just 30 minutes and keep keep it up at least five days per week, that will get you to that minimum goal of 150 minutes. Perfect. All right, moving on. So how do you run on pace when you're used to running with groups where someone else is pacing you? This person says, I'm lazy when alone and can't seem to hold specific paces, although I know I can do it when I'm in a group. All right, there's a little accountability here. We're going to throw this over to Bonnie and Bethany and Heather, the group. Bonnie, do you want to start? Is she there? I can start while we're waiting for Bonnie. Maybe she's. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a really interesting one. I have a lot of runners that come in and, and just stopped doing any of their, uh, their tempo and their, their track workouts primarily because they didn't have the group to meet to do it. Um, but there are a lot of tools that you can use for 1, um, going back to the idea of kind of adapting and finding a new normal for a little bit. It won't be exactly the same, but you can use you if you have a Garmin watch or any. other tell you your pace while you are running or I really like to um, think about it in terms of like the zones that you're working in. So even if you're not going to track it um, with your actual time or pace, thinking about how hard you're working and really thinking about am I pushing hard enough to get into that kind of hard to very hard zone? Am I doing a threshold run where it feels like I want to stop, but it's just, you know, at a pace where I can keep going for a little bit? Um, so kind of tuning back into to yourself and how you're feeling. If that doesn't work for you and you like numbers, you can always use your heart rate zone to know like which heart rate zone do I have to be in to get into that pace and keep it there. It's also a good opportunity to get a little bit more accountability in their own running um, person saying that they're lazy. They could use it as an opportunity to really understand what that feeling is on the rate of perceived exertion, like you said. Yeah. And also on a personal note, just Anecdotally, I know that, especially with technology these days, and a lot of runners really like to listen to music. I'm sure on YouTube or many of the music apps these days, you can very easily just search what your pace is or what your desired pace will be. And music will come up that you can match with the metronome or the beat of the music with your stride if you need that external cue but like i said that's something that maybe personally i would do if i needed that external motivation and i agree with all the above <laughs> that uh, also logging is so important i think that to celebrate as i mentioned the small steps of progress and to remind yourself why why you want to do it you know what are the benefits and uh you know if i ask myself am i glad that i did it after after it's over um, and I, my answer will be yes, then, then do it. Right? So if the answer is yes, by all means, go for it. Um, but it's important to, um, I think the consistency is a, is a big factor there too, because once you're in the group, you, you want to do it then, you know, you, you miss it if you don't. So uh, I think routine is important. Mm -hmm. I love that. So Samantha, I'm going to loop you in. Uh, we've got a. Nutrition question here. Will I have enough energy to train for a marathon while I'm in a caloric, excuse me, chlor, um, caloric deficit? Um, it depends on how much of a deficit that is. We generally don't like to recommend trying to lose weight when you're training for an event because your body needs the energy to meet the challenge that you're giving it. So if you're restricting that energy, then you're also going to be restricting your ability to train and to advance that training as you go. You can certainly modify your diet to be healthier and go back to what I, as I was talking about, a more balanced approach. I'm, uh, you know, we know we have a lot of epidemiological studies that that have found that a more a more plant based approach to eating is healthier. The fiber helps our gut stay healthy when our gut is healthy. Our immune system is healthy. And we know that GI run that um, GI distress is not uncommon in in longer distance runners. Um, so being healthy and balanced, just doing that may help you shed a little bit of that extra weight that that you're thinking of losing. But generally, you don't 
you don't want to do both at the same time because then you're working at odds with yourself. You're trying to have the energy you need to pick up your speed, to be healthy, to have your muscles function, to keep your alignment, to work on all of those strength training and alignment tips you got today from Bethany and from Heather. Um, and then and then you won't have the energy to support that if you're not consuming adequate calories to support that training and that challenge. So I don't love that idea, but but to figure out what you're doing, what you might need to do, maybe you just need to cut out some sugar sweetened beverages. You may lose a few pounds doing that, but that's okay because you're going to be eating healthier food. You probably want to work with a registered dietitian, um, and he or she can sit down with you and craft a diet that can help meet your needs. Uh, take into consideration your budget, what you have available, uh, what you do and don't like. That's really helpful. Thank you. And while I have you, I'd love to throw you this question here that we have in the question box. What are your thoughts on consuming plain, zero fat Greek yogurt? You know, what, the reason that we like Greek yogurt is that it's been basically strained. So a lot of the water is out and it's more concentrated. So you get more protein. Um, so that's why we like Greek yogurt. It's interesting in the nutrition world. We used to always say low fat, non fat, that's the way to go. And we're sort of spinning around in the other direction now, saying, you know, if you have a balanced diet, having some regular full fat yogurt may not be such a bad idea. So I generally say to my athletes, you know, 2% Greek yogurt is great, or 0% is fine as well. I suggest getting plain and then adding what you want to it. If you want to add some honey and some fruit and some cinnamon or some spinach or all those kinds of things to sweeten it up a little because it is a little tart, that's fine. I'd rather have you decide how sweet it is than a food company. Awesome. Thank you. Bethany, I'm going to throw this one to you. And do you have any advice for an Achilles strain? It's been tight for a few weeks, I think due to running on hills while out of the city for two weeks. Seems to be getting worse rather than better. Sure. Um, this is a case where I would probably look up the chain a little bit. Ideally, what's happening is you want to be able to use your large glute max muscles or max for a reason to propel your body forward. If you're not getting that propulsion through your glute max, things down the chain will start to take over to produce that power. And your calf muscles are just too small to be able to do that consistently. So when you look up the chain, you just want to make sure that you have that hip extension. So maybe your hip flexors are getting stretched out to even get that activation through your glutes. You want to make sure that you have a solid core because if you try to activate your glutes off of a very weak foundation, you're not going to get the same activation pattern as you would if you had a nice strong core foundation for the big glute muscle to work off of. And then once you get those two, you just want to make sure that you're activating your glutes more than you are your hamstrings. So that's where a good bridging exercise would come in where you're really focusing on the glutes more than anything. And then once you hit those, then you should probably be able to notice that a lot of your Achilles symptoms are starting to tone down a little bit, assuming that there's no, that this is purely from running and running form and there's no other insidious things going on. Okay. Thank you for that. We have Shelby here. She's a Runners World Plus member. Hi, Shelby. Thanks for joining. Um, and her question is for Sam, what is the best pre-race meal the night before? That is a very good question, and I'm going to answer it by not answering it and say, you don't just want the meal the night before to be a good pre-race meal. You want your entire training meals to be healthy. So if you have a, pre if you have a race coming up, you want to start increasing your car the starchy carbohydrate intake, you know, maybe about two weeks before. And that doesn't mean you have to load up. That just means maybe a little extra pasta with dinner, maybe another piece of toast in the morning, a little extra cereal, just to get those glycogen stores up, just to make sure that you have loaded those carbohydrates. You know, we used to say you have to carbohydrate load three, don't eat it, and then eat carbs three days before and load it up. I, I think we're finding that that isn't optimal. And it's also probably not not optimal for your stomach and for your training. I would also suggest don't eat anything that you're not used to eating. Don't do anything you've never done before. Make sure you're eating foods you're comfortable with. And if you want to have that, you know, a, a nice dinner or meal that has a little extra carbohydrate, you know, your spaghetti dinner, the traditional spaghetti dinner, is just fine if that's something that you normally eat. 
But you want to, the closer you get to race day, the closer you get to the time, 30 minutes, 15 minutes before, an hour before, that's when we start cutting back on the, on the fiber, the protein, and the fat and go for those easily digested carbohydrates like white bread or some Gatorade or some or something sweet like a handful of cereal. That's when we want something that's easily digested and absorbed so it gets out of your stomach quickly to fuel your run. But for the night before, I would say something that's comfortable, not too heavy, but balanced and something you're used to. Awesome. That's helpful. Thank you. I have a few more questions. I we did a I'm close friends runners world plus submission and I want to get these in. So this one's probably for Heather and I think Bonnie. Um, how do you start running? <laughs> uh, great. I'll start. You put your right foot forward and your left. <laughs> uh, so to start running, everybody's a little different. Um, it goes all the way down to what type of muscle fibers you have and that there's a genetic component to that. So some can tolerate going out and running a mile or so, like right out of the gate. Some people need a little bit more time to build up to that. So one of the best strategies is to do a run walk program to start. So starting with just two minutes of walking or sorry, two minutes of jogging. Don't worry about your pace. Don't focus on your pace at all in the beginning. That will come once you get more experience. And then three minutes of walking and then just going in a pattern like that, 20 to 30 minutes. Try to do it a couple of days per week because it's best to do it a couple of days per week. Maintain that consistency so you continue to improve. And then just build from there so you can start to elongate the time and try to shorten the, the walking um, duration. So eventually you're in a jog the whole time. Also considering that um, you don't necessarily want to get in your head too much about your running form right away too, because when everybody's just starting running, you are not in, in perfect form. The more experienced runners actually have more neuromuscular coordination. So your running form actually does improve as you, as you continue to run as well. Yeah. I would agree with um, with Heather, and you know, I, I think of baby steps. You know, just uh, start small, start small, and build up, mm -hmm. and uh, build up your confidence, and and really be mindful in the moment because uh, be aware of your body, pay attention to how you feel, how good you feel afterwards, and uh, log your progress again, and you know, and maybe walk with a buddy who social distances, you know, someone who's very. Uh, COVID aware and someone who will take uh, a safer way of walking um, with you. So, and, and of course, the music too uh, is, helps. <laughs> Thank you. And Bethany, I'm going to throw this one to you. It's a very important one, I would say. When is it okay to run through the pain? Or is Ooh. it? It it really depends on the type of pain that you're having. Are you having a very sharp, acute pain that's really nagging at you? And every time you take a step, you feel it. Um, that I would say, stop, rest, take a break, maybe try again, but probably not. If it's more of a deep burn, maybe a fatigue, burning sensation sort of pain, maybe, maybe you're just fatigued. Maybe you can go a minute or two further, but I wouldn't really push it. I wouldn't really push it more than that. So it's really the difference between a sharp acute pain and more of a burning, aching sensation coming with working and doing more. And then I'm going to couple that up with this question here. And what are your thoughts on compression socks during running? And are they effective for post run recovery? Ooh, I might have to tie Heather into this one a little bit too. Yes, please do. <laughs> she would actually know way more than I would on this. Yeah, All right. Yes. Well, I, <laughs> there's there's not a lot of good science on it, so, so I can't, can't give you a really great answer. But what I can tell you is, from the literature we do have, on small on small runners out and doing multiple races in one day, let's say like you're doing like track races, it can be beneficial to wear them because you can recover a little bit quicker between each bout. But in terms of wearing them for like, let's say you're running three or four days per week um, and wearing them during the runs, that's not necessarily going to get you a better recovery for the next run that you're going to do during the week. Um, what really is going to give you the best benefit is your sleep patterns, your nutrition, your hydration, and how you're treating your body. 
I love that. What would you say about shin splint prevention? Mm. Mm, that's a that's a good one. Um, prevention would be more so also looking up the chain, making sure a lot of things up the chain are quite strong. I have said this about 17 times already, but the gluteal muscles, especially the biggest thing with shin splints is looking at your running form, making sure that you're not necessarily a, a heel strike. Well, not a heel striker when you're reaching out in front of yourself and being a heel striker, if you're landing underneath yourself and being a heel striker. That's completely different um, and making sure that you're really instead of reaching out in front of you and landing and pulling yourself forward that you're landing underneath yourself and using your glutes to push back because that will decrease the amount of force that your body is absorbing and a lot of that shock that you really don't want not necessarily want your shins to absorb you want all the muscles in the rest of your legs to absorb those for you and then the treatment for that treatment for that well it really is very individualized um, a lot of runners that we see in the run lab we can come in and already make tweaks to their form right away that could help with that when patients come directly to me in clinic it's usually a mix of stretching the area strengthening dynamically around the entire ankle but usually i'm going to try and get that runner sooner rather than later on the treadmill to see what their running form looks like and see if we can make tweaks in that regard that's helpful. Thank you. And lastly, um, I'll give you, Bethany and Heather, this last question. Why do we place such an emphasis on the running shoe? And what are your standing points on a running shoe that's a little bit more minimal, low drop versus traditional chunky type of shoe? The age old question here. I know. Uh, Heather, I'll I'll first, and then I'm going to pitch most of it to you, Bethany. But <laughs> so yeah. I think like this, that just reminded me of, of Sam saying like, there's no one magical food. I think a lot of times people are looking for a shoe to fix all their problems, make them run faster, mm -hmm. reduce their shin pain. And really what we know about shoe fit is like, it's the shoe that feels the best on your feet that don't, they're not uncomfortable when you're running on them. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, everybody's different and every shoe is gonna feel different on each person. So there's not necessarily one trick. I know back, when the, the you know barefoot running came out, the, it seemed like the magical thing was to get as, as little of a heel to toe difference as you can in the shoe. Again, that's variable on the person whether or not that works or not. For some people, you know, having a very um, limited heel rise is going to actually cause some problems rather than fix something. So, Bethany, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yes, yeah. exactly like you're saying, Heather. Uh, it really depends on the person. With the minimalist shoe, it's not something that you can just jump into. You really need to train into it because if you say one day I'm going to wear a minimalist shoe or I'm going to do barefoot running, you could really start to have calf Achilles tendon issues. Um, also, you if you have an overly chunky heel running shoe, that might be feeding into already bad habits that you might have where you are landing out on your heel quite hard. So they're probably there's other things that need to be looked at if you're really picking a shoe for a very specific reason, except for a shoe that you're wearing out of comfort that you think is best for you and you're running. Makes sense. So, well, panel team of experts, thank you so much for such helpful information and a great discussion today. Um, as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and will be published on NYU Langone's YouTube channel and will be shared with all of us. If you'd like to know more about the Round World Plus program, which I am the coach of, um, we'd love to have you. We do weekly workouts. We do, uh, you know, newsletters and lots of training plans. You can find us at runnersworld.com uh, backslash plus, and we'll see you there. So if you'd like to schedule an appointment with any of our experts today or learn, learn more about their services, you can visit us at nyulangone.com org backslash sports health or call 646-501-7109. So, and thank you to our viewers. Thank you for our guests, the questions, the support, the interest. Um, and we hope you find this informative as well as helpful in your running journey. So thank you team. Thank you everyone. And best of luck in your running. <laughs>